But why don't we take just a couple of minutes? You've got a pretty interesting background. Why don't you talk about some of the other things that you've done uh, related to history, local history, and understanding the uh, the Revolutionary War? Um, actually, I didn't start with Revolutionary War history, believe it or not. I um, I went to college out in Virginia, for undergrad at least, um, in Fredericksburg. I went to Mary Washington College, which is now a university. And uh, I have a degree in historic preservation. I actually um, you know, wanted to preserve buildings and museum design, that kind of stuff. But I kind of fell into uh, park work and tour guiding when I took a, um, a seasonal job with the National Park Service at Fredericksburg Battlefield. And so my career took a different path. I started at Civil War sites, um, but I grew up outside of Philadelphia. And when I got out of school, I wanted to just move closer to home. And I initially took a job at Daniel Boone's birthplace, which is uh, near Reading, Pennsylvania, actually not far from where I live now. And, um, you know, it's farm history. It was Quaker history. Really wasn't my thing. I'm more of a military guy. So um, an opportunity opened after a few years to take a position and a transfer to Brandywine Battlefield. Um, and that's really where I started digging in the Revolutionary War history. Um, so it eventually led to my first book on the Battle of Brandywine. Um, and um, eventually I moved into the teaching world. But um, basically those two books grew, my two books grew out of working at Brandywine for, how long was I there? Uh, like four years I was there. Well, that's, that's great. Let me just welcome folks tonight. Uh, I'm Lee Wright. I'm the founder of History Camp. I'm near Boston. And with me in Virginia is... Hi, I'm Carrie Lund. I'm the director of The Pursuit of History, the nonprofit that brings these discussions to you each week. We are happy to welcome Michael C. Harris with us tonight. Michael is a graduate of University of Mary Washington and the American Military University. He has worked for the National Park Service in Fredericksburg, Virginia, Fort Mott State Park in New Jersey, and the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission at Brandywine Battlefield. He conducted tours and staff rides of many of the East Coast battlefields. Michael is certified in secondary education and currently teaches in the Philadelphia region. He lives in Pennsylvania with his wife, Michelle, and son, Nathaniel, and his first book, Brandywine was awarded the American Revolution Roundtable of Richmond Book Award in 2014. His new book and the topic of our discussion tonight is Germantown, a military history of the battle for Philadelphia, October 4, 1777. Thank you for joining us tonight, Michael. Thank you for having me. Michael, let's, let's start with a, a topic that uh, I, th I think would be of great interest to folks. Uh, what is your assessment, having looked deeply at uh, Brandywine, Germantown, and others. What's your assessment of Washington as a battlefield commander? He's not good. <laughs> um, uh, that's a simplified version, but basically you got to keep in mind, he only wins twice. He only wins at Trenton and Princeton. Um, Yorktown never happens without the French and specifically the French fleet. Um, yes, he's there and he, he takes that victory, but it doesn't happen without the French. Um, he has more disasters than successes on a battlefield. Remember, he starts a global war. The French and Indian War starts because of him, and it turns into a global war. Um, and he loses throughout the Philadelphia campaign. He doesn't have a single victory in the Philadelphia campaign, um, including Germantown. Now, that said, just because you're bad tactically on a battlefield doesn't mean you're a bad guy. Because I know when I say that in my talks, a lot of heads start spinning that I'm taking a dig at Washington. Um, but the fact that he kept the army together through all the disasters it went through, uh, whether it was these losses or food shortages and supply shortages, the fact he kept the army together is why he's great. Because the army is the symbol of the revolution, not Congress. If Congress, if the Continental Congress was so great, why do we have to get rid of it and write a constitution? Um, because the, the army is the symbol. If the army had collapsed, the revolution would have collapsed. And that's why Washington's great why he made a great president um, doesn't mean he's good on a battlefield. Well, let's let's go then to Brandywine and, and kind of set that up. And there's actually a, a fair amount that we need to go into to really provide the context for that. So uh, October 4, 1777, take us back then what, and, 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 and then get us up to that point where, where this conflict occurs. Yeah, I'll try to kind of go through this as quick as I can. It's kind of complicated. So. Um, 
Washington's going to be very reactionary with the Continental Army throughout this campaign. He's kind of waiting to see what the British do most of the time. Um, now, the British plan goes back to the previous winter. Um, they had this long-standing plan to divide New England off from the middle colonies and the southern colonies along the Lake Champlain Hudson River corridor. And the, the campaign to capture New York City in 19, in, I'm sorry, 1776 was sort of a, an opening phase of that campaign to, 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 to get control of the mouth of the Hudson River. So what was supposed to happen in 1777 is William Howe, with that army in New York, was, start, was supposed to move up the Hudson River, up north, while John Burgoyne led an army south out of Canada along the Lake Champlain corridor. They were supposed to meet in Albany and effectively cut New England off from everybody else. Well, if you know a little bit about the revolution, that doesn't happen. And because that doesn't happen, you have the Saratoga campaign and the capture of a British army at Saratoga at the same time all this stuff around Philadelphia is going on. Um, so it's a, you know, both those campaigns are happening at the same time. So what actually happens at Philadelphia? Well, William Howe is going to take, you know, roughly... 15,000 troops plus support personnel on 267 ships and sail out of New York Harbor. But rather than going north, he's going to go south. Um, he will momentarily duck into the Delaware Bay and makes a horrendous decision to not go up the Delaware River and land somewhere just south of Philadelphia. Um, we don't really have the time to discuss that decision, but he doesn't do that. Um, he will choose to spend another month at sea going around the Delmarva Peninsula and up the Chesapeake Bay, landing in late August uh, outside modern Elkton, Maryland. While all that was going on, his troops were running out of fresh food. Their horses were dying and being thrown overboard. Um, he, the army is actually not in the best of shape supply-wise or health-wise when they get off their ships. Some of those troops have been on ships for between six to eight weeks combined from uh, just sitting in the harbor in New York and travel time. Washington, in the meantime, is sort of um, slowly moves south, and he's positioned himself in northern Delaware to block the approaches to Philadelphia. Uh, Howe, William Howe will begin maneuvering late August, and then you have a, a, a relatively minor engagement on September 3rd um, at a place called Cooch's Bridge in Delaware. Largest battle in Delaware history, but kind of a minor thing. Um, after that, the two armies are going to parallel each other, basically up either sides of the Brandywine River and to southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, which sets up the Battle of Brandywine on September 11th, 1777. And William Howe will execute a flanking maneuver very similar to the one he used on Long Island the previous year. In fact, he'd used it six times previously. It was not a new tactic and one Washington should have been looking for and wasn't. And Washington gets outflanked and will lose the Battle of Brandywine. Now, why is that important? Because it exposes Philadelphia. The Brandywine at that time was a natural defensive barrier. You could only cross it where the fords, where the roads crossed it, at fords. You go there today, you, you can walk across it almost anywhere. So it's very deceiving today. Um, so Washington has to get himself into a position to block the roads to the next natural defensive barrier, which was the Schuylkill River. And at the time, Philadelphia sat on a very narrow peninsula formed by the Delaware and the Schuylkill Rivers. Those of you that may be familiar with Philadelphia today, it's much larger and go, and spreads across the Schuylkill River today. But at the time, the old part of the city was on that peninsula formed by those two rivers. So Washington needed to defend the Schuylkill now. So after a series of maneuvers in the five days following the Battle of Brandywine, he gets, he's starting to get himself into a blocking position south of the Schuylkill to block a road juncture that leads to multiple fords along the Schuylkill, um, roughly in the area of Immaculata College, if you know where that's at, um, just east of modern Exton, Pennsylvania. Um, he's trying to get into this blocking position. And the same day that that's happening, this is September 16th, the British are moving off the Brandywine battlefield and you get this meeting engagement, uh, which becomes known as the battle of the clouds. 
and it becomes known as the Battle of the Clouds because both armies are kind of getting ready to go at it, and this massive rainstorm breaks out and ruins the ammunition of both armies, um, making the weapons very ineffective unless you have bayonets, which the Americans were very poorly supplied with. And so uh, Washington got himself in a bad position with muddy roads um, and had to get out of there. And he had to replace his ammunition supply. So he's forced to move way west towards uh, supply depots in the Pennsylvania backcountry, oh, exposing um, the Schuylkill River temporarily. But the British are in bad shape. Remember, remember, they don't have all those horses when they got off the ships. So they're constantly stopping to raid the countryside for livestock, supplies, food from the Pennsylvania countryside. And they're going to do that again after this Battle of the Clouds. And so they're stalled out south of the Schuylkill, giving Washington a little bit of time. So while Washington's resupplying and then maneuvering north of the Schuylkill to block the, the, the Fords, he left one division behind under the command of Anthony Wayne behind the British lines, sort of. The British, because of local support, find out about this, and they are going to attack Anthony Wayne's camp in the middle of the night. That's how you get the Battle of Paoli on the night of September 21st. So that's three days after the Battle of the Clouds. By getting rid of that threat to his rear, Howe's able to maneuver up to the Schuylkill River. He sort of tricks Washington to move out of the way. Washington moves west, exposing the lower fords to the British, and they cross the Schuylkill River, roughly where Valley Forge Park is today, is where they cross. And then they will eventually move into an encampment at Germantown. Uh, they arrive there on September 25th. And the next morning, they send a very large column under Charles Cornwallis to, uh, to officially occupy Philadelphia. That's the morning of September 26th, which begins a nine-month occupation of the city of Philadelphia. But they left a very sizable force of their army in Germantown. So fast forward, uh, I'm trying to do the math real quick in my head, Set six, seven days, Washington has slowly moved his way um, into a position about, i to think of it distance, um, maybe 10 miles from the British camp at Germantown at that point. And he has a decision to make. He's been reinforced. His army is actually close to equal in size to what it was uh, at Brandywine because he's been reinforced by some units. And they have to make a decision. And the decision is let's go destroy the British force in Germantown um, because it's a much smaller force than the one we fought at Brandywine because they've sent these detachments to occupy Wilmington and Philadelphia and a fort in New Jersey called Billingsport. So the army, the British have, have shrunk in the size of their force and it's vulnerable. At least that was the theory. So hopefully that sets up Germantown. <laughs> well, it, it, it does. You mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the weather and how that changed uh, the battle of the clouds. Uh, I believe as, as, as we go through what happened here in uh, in Germantown? Weather played a role, uh, also. Yeah. Um, why don't you take us through that that battle uh, and uh, the extent to which there were loyalists in the area that might uh, be supporting uh, the British and creating uh, challenges for for Washington? Yeah, let's start with the loyalist part. Uh, let me start with that, because that's almost a separate question. So one of the reasons that they choose to come and try to occupy Philadelphia, which they do, I mean, I just went through that, but is they were told by some Pennsylvania loyalists while they were still in New York that there was a great deal of support, loyalist support in Pennsylvania and in the middle colonies in general. And that if the army just appeared, all these loyalists would rise up to support the army. It was a false assumption. Um, Joseph Galloway specifically is the one that convinces William Howe of this. He's the former speaker of the Pennsylvania Assembly and a former friend of Benjamin Franklin's actually, before he turns towards the other side. Um, and when Howe gets here, he's not getting that support. I mean, yes, I, he's getting some support. Yes, some locals are giving him intel on Washington. Some locals are joining loyalist units but not the thousands they were expecting. It's just sort of dribs and drabs, and it causes problems for him 
be, for you know, so he's got to send detachments of his main force, British regulars, to occupy points in his rear that he could have been using loyalist forces to do, freeing up British regulars to fight Washington, which is one of the problems that's causing. It's one of the reasons he has such a small force in Germantown. Um, but in other times, it does. It serves him very well. There's two locals that guide his flanking column at Brandywine and tells them exactly what roads to use and which fords aren't being watched by watching, being watched by Washington. Um, it's locals, it's loyalists that tell him about Anthony Wayne's camp and allows him to hit that camp at the Battle of Paoli. So there's there's sort of it's like a two-edged sword. Like in some ways it was beneficial to him, but he's not getting the massive support he was sort of promised would happen if he just appeared. The reality of it is Pennsylvania wasn't as heavily loyalist as everybody thought. Um, because there's such a strong Quaker population in Pennsylvania, which are technically neutral, not really supporting either side. I mean, there's exceptions to that. Um, there was an assumption because they weren't supporting the Patriots that they would rise up and, su and support the British. That was a false assumption because they're, they're neutral. They're pacifists. They're not going to support anybody. Um, so I, 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 you know, so part of this campaign was predicated on that false promise that never materialized. Um, then you were also asking me about Germantown, which was a sort of a separate question. So why, why don't we, why don't we get to Germantown then? Okay. So Washington's plan is exceptionally complicated. You got to sort of put your mindset in the 18th century. There's no GPS, there's no radios, cell phones. The only way you're communicating uh, uh, amongst different columns or divisions of your army is by courier on horseback. So you get that in your mindset and then process that they're going to march in the middle of the night down narrow, dark roads on uh, five different roads. It's an exceptionally bold and ambitious plan. The shocking thing is they pull that part of the plan off. All five of these columns, more or less within maybe 15, 20 minutes of each other, actually get to where they were supposed to be at roughly the same time. It's a shocking accomplishment, and they pulled it off. And even though the British had been warned, there was rumors coming in all night that the Americans were coming. For reasons I, I just can't figure out in the primary documents, that information did not disseminate out to the entire army. So while elements of the British army were sort of out of bed and waiting, the most important ones that were going to get hit first had no idea it was coming. And these Americas opened up on them on the morning of October 4th, storming out of this dense early morning fog and caught these advanced posts completely unprepared and uh, actually drove in not only those outposts, but completely crushed the entire right wing of the British Army um, outside their camps. And we're on the verge of a spectacular victory um, when everything sort of turns, partially because of fog and, in my opinion, horrendous decision making at the highest levels of the Army. Um, you want me to go into that now or do you want to have a question about that? <laughs> well, that, that, that's, such a, that's such a great lead in. Let's pursue that. Okay, so... Um, what happens is the Americans, um, for the first hour, hour and a half of the battle, are just driving everything before them. And they actually drove the British all the way in towards um, an area known as Market Square, which the, the square is still there in the middle of Germantown, if you ever um, are in the Pennsylvania area. Um, they, been, they drove them back several couple miles. Um, the problem is those frontline units that began the battle were starting to run out of ammunition. Um, and there was, you know, some disorganization for, you know, success brings disorganization, especially in 18th or 19th century linear warfare. Just that drive of pursuit of an enemy is going to disorganize your forces. So they need to regroup. Um, and Washington actually was prepared for this. He had a division and reserve of North Carolina and New Jersey troops that were supposed to cycle forward to continue the fight and let everybody else regroup. Um, and just as they were getting ready to send that division forward, um, they realize or they, 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 they come to learn that just a couple of companies of British troops of the 40th Regiment of Foot have run into 
uh, Benjamin Chu's country estate known as Cliveden, this massive stone house, country estate, basically, which the Americans had passed. The, the units that were doing the attacking went by it. They didn't see these British troops in this house, all the fog and confusion. And I actually think the British troops were barricading it and getting ready to fight from it. So they weren't shooting out of it when everybody was passing. So nobody realized they were in there. And just as they're getting ready to send this fresh division forward, which is still behind the house or approaching the house is maybe a better way to look at that. Um, they have to make a decision of what to do about those British troops in this house, which is now in their rear, rear area. They're, you know, behind their front lines. And there's a huge debate that plays out in the middle of battle on the edge of the Clifton property. And the two big players in it are Henry Knox and Timothy Pickering. Now, Henry Knox is the chief of artillery for the army, famous for his deeds outside of Boston. And Timothy Pickering, also a Massachusetts native, is the army's adjutant general. And the Timothy Pickering said, hey, we, this battle is not over. We have not won anything. Ignore that house. Let's keep going. Stick one regiment in front of it to keep those guys from coming out. And we got to keep going. We haven't won anything. And Henry Knox, all right, everybody take a deep breath. I'm going to take a dig at Knox now. <laughs> Knox, who is famous basically for moving a bunch of cannon from Ticonderoga to Boston, but really hasn't commanded anybody in a real battle. And he's a self-taught guy because he owned a bookstore. He claims you can't leave what he refers to as a castle in our rear, that we must deal with this castle before we do anything else. He's completely wrong. From a military standpoint, he's wrong. You could have easily put 100 guys in front of the front door of that house, and they would have never been able to come out, and everybody else could have kept going. And in my opinion, Washington makes the worst decision and sides with Knox. He goes, okay, we got to deal with this house. And that changes the whole battle because while they're playing games with these maybe 50 guys in this house, everybody on the front lines is out of ammunition. They now hear shooting going on behind them as the Americans are pounding this house with artillery and charging up the, the driveway with regiments, New Jersey regiments, trying to break in the front door of the house, which is a utter disaster. So all these guys that are up front hear all this going on behind them and units that are out of ammunition start trickling to the rear to find out what's going on. In the fog, they don't know what's going on. And now you start ending up with friendly fire incidents with units shooting into each other. Um, the British are able to regroup because of that and counterattack. And then the British just push the Americans right back off the battlefield because of all the confusion created at Cliveden. <laughs> so, uh, so let's do the kind of minor thing and then go forward. Um, so what did happen at that house? A lot. Um, they go through several verse attempts to get them out of the house, the British out of the house. The first thing they do is they just try to hit it with artillery. Um, the problem is the front and the two sides of the house are very thick granite walls. And the Americans don't have siege artillery with them. They have field guns, you know, like three pounders and four pounders, maybe six pounders, not guns with the caliber enough to knock down these granite walls. So they're, the shot are just bouncing off the side of the house. Or they, I mean, they, were, they, they did blow open the front doors. The, the statuary in the yard was, you know, arms and limbs are flying off the statuary. Urns were shot off the top of the roof line. I mean, they did damage to the house, but they didn't, like, cave it in. So it doesn't work. The next thing that's attempted, um, and actually I don't think orders were actually given it for this. I think a couple of New Jersey officers just decided to try it. Two regiments, the first and third New Jersey, charge up the lane and try to go through the barricade that is the front door. And they're just getting picked off in the yard of the house as the British are shooting out of the second story windows. So that doesn't work. And that's actually what's depicted on the cover of the book which I think you showed the cover earlier, or maybe you're showing it later. Um, so that doesn't work. Um, then they try to burn them out. It's a stone house. So they, they um, actually back up. The first thing is that, I, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Before they even pounded it with artillery, 
they tried to summon the British to surrender. They sent a, guy, a, a staff officer up the, the, the driveway with a, with a white handkerchief on a stick or a sword. Well, the British, first of all, if they could even see the white flag in the fog, shoot the guy. So that didn't work. Then the artillery, then the charge of the New Jersey regiments. Then they try to burn it. They, they tried to move a hay wa a wagon full of hay or straw up to one of the side windows of the house and light it on fire. Well, all those guys start getting picked off, including John Lawrence, who's the son of Henry Lawrence, who will be president of the Congress not long after this. Uh, he gets shot in the shoulder, John Lawrence. Um, so none of it works. And by the time all of that scene is sort of played out over a, I don't know, 20, 30 minute period, all those frontline units are starting to trickle back. And that's how the, the, the friendly fire stuff starts to happen. It's crazy. It, it is surprising that, uh, that no one simply said, let's just lay siege as it were to the cat, to the castle and, 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 and continue pushing ahead. I, nobody did. Well, I'm not sure Pickering did. And there were some others that were sort of in agreement with him. Um, can't think of the guy. Caleb Gibbs, who's the commander of Washington's lifeguard, um, he's on the Pickering side. Pickering actually does a great job in his later life of detailing this incident in multiple letters he writes. Um, and then uh, it's funny, and Knox doesn't even talk about it. If you read his his letters or, or journals, acts like it never even happened, probably <laughs> because it was his fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, many, how many men were actually in the house? Uh, I can't remember the exact number. It's it's not many, 50. It's only a couple companies. Most of the regiment, that's one of the myths of the battles. One of the myths of the battles, the whole regiment ran into this house. Well, the whole regiment's not going to fit in that house. Um, I think it's two, maybe three companies at the most. The rest of that regiment fell back with everybody else. So it's not a lot of guys. Interesting. So so we talked about the the... the the chaos, uh, uh, troops running out of ammunition, coming to the rear, trying to see what's what's going on, what all this firing's about, and so forth. Uh, and then what happens from there? Well, what, the British are able to regroup um, because of all the – between the, the Americans running out of ammo, those front-line units, and then starting to move to the rear, um, it allowed the British units that had been driven in to, to regroup. Um, fresh units that had not fought kind of shift to – stabilize the right flank because James Grant's right wing was completely crushed on the right side of the British camp. And um, so some, some fresh units from the left wing shift over to the other side of German, what's today Germantown Avenue to stabilize that wing. Um, but all that was allowed to happen because of the chaos um, in the Amer on the American side. Um, and basically once they regrouped and started pushing, there was nothing to stop them because even the American units that hadn't fall back, fallen back, might have only had one or two rounds of ammunition left. They were not in a position, in a state to stop that at that point. Um, and then it, they basically, the British recover all the ground um, and the Americans retreat um, not only as far as they left from, they retreat past that all the way out to where modern Schwenksville is today. Uh, they actually retreated farther than they marched that night. So their total, some of the regiments that, that between the night they left and the retreat in the next day, some regiments 20, 25 miles. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's crazy. <clears throat> and then the uh, Washington's next move, uh, did he then go to Valley Forge for his winter encampment? Uh, no, actually, that'll be the subject of my next book. <laughs> He's going to, um, mostly what's going to happen after this is it becomes a, a, a river war for the most part. So, um, even though the British have troops in Philadelphia, they do not have control of the Delaware River. There was a series of fortifications and obstructions in the river that the Americans still controlled or protected. And so the British fleet could not get up the river. Um, and until they did that, there was serious danger of starving, not just for the civilian population, but for the army as well, the British army. And so Washington's goal over the next, I'm trying to, do over five, six weeks is going to be, can we maintain the river forts and prevent the British fleet from getting up and, and just hold that until the river freezes over for the winter? That was kind of the goal. 
um, starve them out, almost like they did at Boston. And um, they just don't have enough troops. Um, the British are going to be able to, um, well, initially they're going to send the Hessian column to the New Jersey side of the river to try to take out uh, uh, Fort Mercer, which is basically directly across from where the Philadelphia airport is, they on the New Jersey side. Um, and actually, that's bloodily repulsed. The Hessians lose badly there. Uh, two Rhode Island regiments repulse the whole brigade of Hessians um, in the Battle of Fort Mercer. That's only about two weeks after Germantown that happens. Um, so they're initially very unsuccessful, the British. They then are going to besiege Fort Mifflin, which is on the Pennsylvania side, uh, which is one of the most horrendous experience for the Americans, in my opinion, the whole war. Um, at that time, Fort Mifflin sat on a mud island in the river. Today, it's now part of the shore. It's literally right next to the Philadelphia airport. The planes land and go buzz the fort today if you go there. Um, and the Americans held out. They never actually surrender the fort, but their, their, their cannons are knocked out of commission. Um, they're, um, they, they're just taking heavy casualty. They can't, there's nothing to defend. At, 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 by mid-November, there was nothing left to defend. And rather than surrender, they leave the flag flying on the night of November 15th and rowboat across to Fort Mercer in New Jersey and just evacuate the fort. The British occupy it on the morning of the 16th. This is November. Um, but because Fort Mifflin's now gone, um, Fort Mercer basically becomes virtually untenable and they're going to evacuate Fort Mercer not long after that. Um, and then the only other fighting that's going to happen, so that's now late November, Howe's going to, William Howe's resigned at this point. He's kind of frustrated and wants to go home. But he's going to make one last attempt to try to bring Washington to battle, uh, pre-Valley Forge. And it's going to be known as the White Marsh Expedition. It's going to be a series of, of minor engagements over a three-day period. This is a, a basically... And I realize many of your viewers are probably not from Pennsylvania. Basically, it's the area around. I'm trying to think of how I could explain it without confusing people. Uh, if you're familiar with the Pennsylvania Turnpike um, and, and uh, where the Germantown is today, there's sort of a, at that point, there was like a no man's land that formed between the two armies, roughly in that zone. And there was a series of hills, uh, Edge Hill and yeah, the Chestnut Hill. Um, that the British are going to approach and the Americans send out troops from the White Marsh Hills to try to skirmish with them. And it, you get a little fight in Chestnut Hill. It's a little fight on Edge Hill. It's ultimately inconclusive, um, but this is like the first week of December. And that's really it. British are going to go in the winter quarters in Philly. Washington's going to maneuver a little bit more, but ultimately he's going to enter Valley Forge on December 19th, about 12 days after the fighting at White Marsh. Um, so that's how they get the Valley Forge. Now, the, despite the loss, there was a, a larger strategic impact, I believe, with Germantown, specifically on the French and their decision to, to support the, uh, the Patriot cause. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, many people assume, Sarah, and they're not wrong, Saratoga is a major factor in getting the French alliance to happen. I'm not denying that at all. I'm not trying to belittle what happened in Saratoga. But if you read uh, Franklin's paper, Benjamin Franklin's papers and John Adams' papers, who were two of the Americans negotiating in France at this time for the French alliance, and then uh, the French foreign minister's writings um, at this time period actually equally credit the fighting at Germantown with Saratoga for getting that French alliance done. You gotta think the, the, the Saratoga surrender is gonna be 15 days after Germantown, excuse me, after Germantown. So it's not long after this. And the reason is not so much that the Americans lost, because I mean, they did lose, but the fact that Washington for the first time in the war launched an offensive with his main army against the main British army. The only time, uh, the first time he does that in the war. Now, previous, you know, Boston was a siege. Um, New York, the New York campaign was all defensive. He's constantly retreating. Trent and Princeton were offensives, but they were against detachments of the British Army. 
he wasn't going up against the whole British army in either of those battles. Brandywine was a defensive battle. So Germantown's the first time he takes his main army and launches it in an offensive against the main British army. And so the French see this and they're like, well, this guy's willing to take chances and be this bold. And one of his subordinates is able to capture an army at Saratoga. Maybe these Americans can win. And maybe we can get some of the stuff back that we lost because of the French and Indian War by helping these Americans. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's basically the reasoning behind it. One last question, and then we're going to go to uh, questions from the audience. Um, it's, it's always interesting to me to think about the challenge of communicating between uh, what, what's going on here in these rebellious colonies and, and in, in London. Uh, and, and, and now we've got uh, the French involved. How does that report of the engagement at Germantown, how does that get back to the French? How long does it take to get back to them? That's a good question. Um, well, I can, let me answer it this way, because I, I don't know the exact timing of when the Germantown report got there, but I do know that you know a ship crossing the Atlantic could take four to six weeks. So any return communicate first, and then that information has to be processed by parliament or the court in, in Paris or uh, Versailles is probably the more correct term. Um, the, you know, by the time they would process that information and then make a decision and then get that decision back to the Americans or the British army in, the, in London's case, it could take two or three months. You know, it's crazy. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons that uh, the Philadelphia campaign is sort of goes bad for the British. When Hal makes a decision to not go up the Hudson River, he doesn't just do that without telling anybody. He does send the dispatch to London, which when he makes a decision, he's screwing John Burgoyne. Like Burgoyne's doomed the moment Hal makes that decision. And it's not like he didn't tell them. But by the time they would even find out, he's already halfway up the Chesapeake Bay. So it ain't like they could do anything about it. It's already too late. So it, it's decisions made here cannot be affected by decisions made in Europe because the lack of communication. Yeah, yeah, that's it's, it's fascinating. Uh, well, Carrie, why don't you rejoin us and and let's bring in. Uh, some of the questions we have from uh, from from guests. All right, we have a viewer who would like to know: Did the arrival of the British troops coincide with the smallpox epidemic in Philadelphia? Oof, there's a question. I don't think so. There had already been a smallpox epidemic. In fact, Washington had inoc He's going to inoculate the army. Where does that happen? I think he does it at Morristown the winter before this. Um, so I don't want to, I'm going to say no to that. I think, I feel like smallpox had already gone through Philadelphia prior to the British arrival. I'm not a hundred percent sure of that, but okay. I, I think I'm right. Yeah. So, Carrie, we had a little problem with the audio there. Um, why don't I repeat that? Is that okay? So, I think the question is, other than the British pickets being driven in by Washington's four columns, did loyalists provide any advance notice of the attack at Germantown? Oh, that's a good question. Did loyalists provide advance knowledge? Um, Trying to process the sources. Okay, so one of the sources of information that night, um, an American flanker, if you're not familiar with 18th century tactics, when you're marching down a road, uh, they would send, you know, a, a squad of guys to, to their right and left called flankers to kind of watch the woods and the fields and make sure your a column's not going to get attacked while you're marching down the road. One of them gets, gets lost and goes down the wrong road that night and gets captured by a British patrol. But he was an American militiaman, if my memory serves, and not a loyalist. So one of, that was one of the sources of information. The other one was a actually a, a patriot, 
well, not like a soldier, but like a, a civilian that was um, supportive of the Patriot cause um, that lived um, trying to uh, basically uh, where the Wissahickon Creek empties into the Schuylkill River, which is right on the, would that be the southern edge of the battlefield or what would become the battlefield? He, I, and Lord knows how he caught wind of it because I don't even understand that. But he somehow caught wind that the Americans were coming. But because the, the, the Hessian soldiers that were camped near there had been very good to his family, and had not like destroyed his property, he felt obligated to warn them that the Americans were coming. Now he's not a loyalist. Um, so that was another source of the information. But I often I'm trying to process in my head what I talked about in the book. I don't think an actual loyalist warned the British that night. So hopefully that answered that person's question. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, last question. Do you think Gates would have prosecuted the war better than Washington in these early stages? Ooh, that's a loaded question. Um, let me think of how I want to answer that. No. <laughs> no, because Gates is not even the aggressive one at Saratoga. It's Benedict Arnold. I mean, I hate to admit that, but Arnold's the one that wants to be aggressive at Saratoga, not Gates. So I don't, I don't consider Gates an aggressive commander. I mean, he gets his butt whooped down at Camden, isn't it, in South Carolina? Isn't that where he loses? And where he finally gets sort of shunned, pushed aside in the Army? Um, so, no, I don't think of Gates as a very aggressive commander. In fact, he's really slow in the retreat across New Jersey, not openly supportive of that retreat prior to Trenton. Um, you know, I'm going to say no. All right. Thank you. All right. This has been just great. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and helping us learn more about this critical battle in the revolution. All right. I am going to share a picture, Lee. Yeah. So we, we have, we have about a page and Carrie's going to, going to bring up, we think a picture that we got earlier today that, sh that shows some of the things going on with History Camp America. Those are 200 plus boxes that are going out to people who've registered and who, who as part of the registration decided they wanted the box. Those shipped today. And we're very excited about that. The, the feedback that we've gotten from the kind of earlier viewers, the people on social media and so forth, who we engaged, uh, they loved the things in the box and, and, and we're eager to hear what people think uh, who, who are going to be receiving those in the next, the next few days. So History Camp America, if you're not aware of it, is taking place on July 10th. It is an all day event. There will be 35 plus sessions that will cover all aspects of history. We'll also have behind the scenes tours. Uh, we'll have some walking tours of uh, some historic areas. John Bell and I just filmed one. Uh, uh, Sunday, um, and the focus was uh, Washington in, in Cambridge, and uh, we ended the day actually at night um, <clears throat> where in Dorchester Heights, where the guns were mounted that ultimately drove the British out of, uh, out of Boston. So there's that really interesting uh, talk and, and so many others. So it's July 10th, go to historycamp.org slash register and you'll learn more. And in the coming uh, days and weeks, we're gonna be announcing more of those sites and tours and sessions. So we really hope you join us. It is, It will be a very special event. It's the first one I've ever done and we've had a great response so far. Carry 40 plus people from how many states was that? 40 plus states? 42 states, England, Canada, and of course, Washington, D.C. Excellent. So we're Excellent. excited so, to welcome people from all over. In, indeed, indeed. Um, Carrie, do you want to wrap up and tell us who we're going to be talking to next week? Yes. First, I just want to remind you, we have a link to Michael's book in the chat. So check that out. It's a really good comprehensive uh, history of this battle. So it's a great resource. And next week, we'll be speaking with Rod Gillis. 
and he is from the Money Museum in Colorado Springs, the uh, part of the Numismatic Association. And he's going to be talking about history through coins, through American coins. So we'll get to hear some stories that you never knew you were carrying around with you. So join us next week. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Have thank a you. good night.